good to be in the Lord's house this morning, and to those who are tuning in online, you're very welcome to our service. We're going to open our worship this morning by singing number 103, Blessed Be the Name. If you're a Christian here this morning, there's only na- one name that's above every other name. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, that he might man redeem. If Let's stand to sing this wonderful hymn. Brother Josh is going to come and lead us in prayer. Thank you, brother. Please be seated. Will you join me with prayer? Our gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for the sunshine. We praise you that it is your day. It is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank you most of all for your son, without whom none of this would be possible. Thank you for all the many blessings you've abundantly bestowed on us and our lives. We pray now that you would join with us, that you would, uh, your Holy Spirit would descend upon us, and that you would move mightily within our midst. Be with our pastor, prepare him as he speaks to us, give him a word in due season. May it penetrate and pierce our hearts. May sinners be drawn to you towards repentance, and may believers be encouraged and edified in their faith. And we also would ask that you would bless the preaching as it goes on in all parts of the world on this day, your Lord's Day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our second hymn is Leads Us to the Cross, number 471. It's in your hymnal. Uh, It's located beneath the seat in front of you. The way of the cross leads home. It's number 471.
us leads home. And Brother Rory is going to come and read the scriptures to us, Psalm 110. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. As Pastor said, Psalm 110. We'll read, we'll read the whole psalm, the middle of the Bible, yes. Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of the strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. We're going to sing a hymn that reminds us of the care and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's number 528. And no one ever cared for me like Jesus. Let's stand to sing.
Well, children, before you go out to your classes, we're just going to seek the Lord. We're going to speak to our friend, the Lord Jesus, who is also our Saviour. And as we sang in that hymn, no one cared for me ever like Jesus. Let's speak to the Lord and join our hands and close our eyes and let's pray. Father in heaven, how true it is when we consider your goodness and your grace in your sending of your son, Jesus Christ, that indeed the care of God, of almighty God, the love of God, the grace of God, the peace of God, the forgiveness from God is all found in your beloved son, and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. There is no one like him. O oh Lord, we pray this morning, as you've reminded us in the hymns and in the reading, that Christ has all authority. And he is the one who was sent of God, born of a virgin in due time, born of the line of David, to be the Saviour of his people. And those of us who have trusted in Jesus this morning can testify that no one ever cared for us like he has. No one has ever sustained us. No one has ever comforted us and consoled us in our times of need like Jesus. Lord, we have friends. We are blessed to have friends and family. But there's no one like the Lord Jesus. For even our family and our friends can't be with us 24 hours a day. But our Lord Jesus never leaves his people and never forsakes his people. And so we come to you this morning in confidence knowing, O oh Father, that you have a purpose and a plan for each of our lives. And our blessed Saviour, we love you, but we ask that you'll help us to love you more. And we pray for those in our congregation who are struggling, who are going through trials and temptations and difficulties. Oh, blessed Saviour, come and comfort your people. We pray for Brother Marco as he preaches this morning in Hazelmere. And we pray for Brother Charles as he's over in Zambia. Keep him safe and bless him as he meets with your people this morning in worship. Pray, Father, for those who are not able to be with us this morning, those who are away on holidays, those who are involved with family, and those who are unwell. Oh, Father, be with each one and keep and bless them. Thank you for those who listen in each week and pray your blessing upon them, their homes, and their families. Father, we pray for our children now. We pray for your blessing upon the work of the gospel in their little hearts. Pray, Lord, as they go out and listen to the stories of Jesus, that indeed they will be touched by the grace of God. And as they memorize those verses of Scripture, may those Scriptures be hidden in their hearts and may they bring forth a great harvest. We, Father, thank you for the children in the church. We thank you for the children's workers. We thank you for the teachers. We thank you for Miss Mariella who oversees and supervises that work. And we pray, Lord, add to our numbers. Oh, that you bring other families into this place, that children would hear the gospel and be saved. Pray for our holiday Bible club in a, in a month's time. Pray, Lord, you'd prepare us even now and prepare the children to come and to hear about the wonderful works of God, to see that there are people in the Bible who are signposts for heaven. Oh, Father, we pray in thanksgiving for the youngest in our congregation, as well as the oldest. And we pray for, oh, Lord, your blessing upon us now as we turn to your holy word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, children, it's lovely to see you here this morning. And we pray for you as you go out to your Sunday school. And for those who are staying in, this morning we're turning to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. I know it's a warm morning, so uh, I'm conscious of that. It's a blessing to be in sweltering heat in England, isn't it? Well, we're turning to Matthew chapter 22, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses. <clears throat> this continues our series in... Uh, who is Jesus Christ? We're in Matthew chapter 22 in verses 41 and 40, 41 to 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, how de then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, 
The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. And this morning we're going to consider together right thinking about Christ. Or our view of Christ. I came across this story this week. It was a story of a man who had become a Christian. And he wrote these words. Neither the tongue nor the pen could ever fully tell of the depths of darkness I willingly entered into, find rest to find peace, joy, anything that seemed to be remotely close to happiness, even if it was only temporary. There was a gaping hole inside of my soul that was hungry to be filled, so hungry and so powerful that it was sucking my life out of me and others who cared for me. I sunk deeper and deeper into the miry clay. I never imagined that there was anyone that could, or much less would, or wanted to rescue me from that place. And then my brother, God bless him, courageously, diligently, and so wisely, lovingly shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. He prayed with me, and I trusted the Lord Jesus. It was October 2010. I recall so vividly that moment when it all made sense. My heart was broken wide open. Jesus gave his life for mine. That moment I wept and cried out to God for mercy. I trusted the Lord Jesus to save me from my soul, save my soul from hell, and I was born again of the Holy Spirit. Being saved is simple. Because there's nothing you must do. This is how he challenges the reader. Because Jesus did it all. I don't know about you, but I think that's a great summary of the, the turmoil that goes on in the human heart as they seek forgiveness, as they seek peace with God, as they seek the blessing of God in salvation. Only the true Christian can ever realize that kind of language. The religious don't get it. Because the religious mind is full of keeping the standards, keeping the rules, keeping the moral standards that are expressly taught by religion. But the Bible teaches us that only when the heart is broken, only when the eyes are opened, only when is it where you're given new glasses and you see Jesus for who he is that you will ever be able to say I'm thinking right about Christ. You see we live in a world of opinions. We live in a world of turmoil but we also live in a world of full of opinions. People have lots of opinions about God. And lots of opinions about Jesus Christ. But the only opinion that really matters is the Lord Jesus' own opinion of himself. And we find that in the Bible. Is this important to us? That we have a right view of Christ? Yes. Because there's too many people with wrong views of Christ and they're on their way to eternal damnation. And that's serious. Is this important to your friends? To the carpenter who lives beside you or the builder or the engineer dealing with this great huge road project called the A14 that seems to be closed more or A1 seems to be closed more than it's open? Yes, it is. Is it important to the mother at home caring for a little children? Yes, it is. Is it important for children preparing for SATs? Yes, it is. Is it important for Young people studying at university, yes, it is. Why? You might say, why? Because this isn't a matter of opinion that you can take or leave the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a wrong view of Jesus Christ on earth, you'll have a wrong... You're on the wrong road. 
You're on the road that leads to eternal death. You see, the question is not, what is the church? We looked at that last year. We're looking at, who is Jesus Christ? And I want us just for a few moments this morning to think of three great truths that come out of this text. The first is this question, the Savior's great question. I did have a PowerPoint, but it doesn't seem to have process. There you go. So you're stuck with me this morning. Oh, well. Pray for me. I like to have the PowerPoint because it helps, I know. But here's the three questions. I'll repeat them as I go through the three great truths. The Savior's great question, number one. The Scripture's grand answer, number two. And our vital response, number three. The Savior's great question. This is not just a religious leader asking a question. This is not just a rabbi from Nazareth. This is not just somebody who was schooled in the religion of Judaic, um, Judaic rabbi writing, writings. This is none other than the Son of God. But it begins with a question. Do you know how many questions the Lord Jesus asked in his earthly ministry? Ever been on this or am I just a bit weird on this? Maybe I am. I believe it's about 150 questions, maybe one or two others. So we could query one, one or two. Do you know how many he asked in Matthew? 45. 45 questions in Matthew. You know, this is a wonderful tool of teaching and education. When I do the children's um, assemblies, they call them collective worships nowadays, I ask them questions. I get them on their toes. In a Sunday evening, if you come to the evening service, I'll get the adults on their toes here. Asking questions. It's good to ask questions. And if the master teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, asked 150 odd questions in his earthly ministry as he taught the great doctrines of the faith, then let's look at the question that he asked. He did not ask, what do you think of religion? Did he? No. No. Or how can I prove God? He didn't ask that either. He didn't think, what do you think of the believers? He asked the question, what think you of me? What think you of Christ? It's very interesting. He doesn't say, what think you of me? He says, what think you of Christ? But who's he asking? Religious leaders who should have known better. It's very interesting how the Lord Jesus is interrogated by two sections of the religious elite of his day. The Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were Sadducee. You've heard that one before. And the Pharisees, because they didn't see very far. That's my own. The Sadducees questioned the Lord Jesus in the previous section over this resurrection. It's a completely improbable scenario. This man who's married and his wife dies and then... Um, or sorry, he dies and the wife is left and then she gets married to six of his brothers. It's improbable. What are they trying to do? Trip him up? Trip up the Lord Jesus? These questions, questions... And ultimately the Lord Jesus said, ye do err not having read the scriptures. Don't you realize that people aren't given or taken in the resurrection of the dead? Ye, not, ye have not read that which was spoken unto you by God. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So the Sadducees are stomached. They're flummoxed. They don't know what to do with this rabbi now. And then of course the Pharisees come in. Ah, we'll get him. We'll get him. We'll get him on the moral law. It's very interesting. You see how, how ingratiating they are. A lawyer said, tempting him. That means testing him. This is a mere creature testing the creator. This is a mere mar man t tempting and testing and interrogating the one who knows all things. And they asked him, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? They're not really interested. 
They're not really interested. They just want to trip the Lord Jesus up and have him contradict to the very word that he brought forth and he gave to Moses at Sinai. The Lord Jesus is genius. And he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. The matter of the heart, all the inward affections, the whole heart of man, the part that you see when you weep, that's part of your, that's the heart expressing itself, or when you laugh, or when you're troubled. The heart and then the soul, all consciousness, all consciousness, and then the mind, all the thought. It's the inward affections, it's the consciousness and the thoughts, it's the whole of man. And the Lord Jesus is saying to these religious leaders, do you love God like this? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength? Of course they do. Just men and women, men like us, dear friends. They're just fallible men. But Jesus did. That's the difference. As he asked them this question, he's basically saying to them, You cannot love God like this, but I can. And I have. And I'll prove it. And then, of course, he gives a summary of the other table of the law. There's two tables in Jesus' mind. The first is the first table which is the four commandments concerning the relationship with God and the second table is the six commandments that are concerned with relationship with men and women the Lord Jesus says and the second is like unto that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself and these two commandments this is verse 40 hang all the law and the prophets and with that he stomached them because in verse 46, there's no more question. No more question. That's very interesting. In verse 41, the Pharisees are gathered together and Jesus now asks them, What think ye of Christ? And this isn't just about your thoughts or your, your vague ideas of Jesus. No, the word here could be translated as understand, comprehend. It's to do with an assessment of the person of Jesus Christ. These people knew what he had done. They had seen his miracle. They had heard his preaching. They're about, they cannot silence him in their integral corrugation, so they'll silence him through crucifixion. But before that, the Lord Jesus asked them this question, What think ye of me? What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they give a good answer. He's the son of David. And this question is vital. Because this morning I'm putting it to you, friend. What is your assessment of Jesus Christ? What do you believe about Jesus Christ? How would you know whether the Jesus Christ you have in your mind and you believe in is the same Jesus Christ as revealed in Scripture? You compare them. I grew up in a country where there was lots of different people who told me lots of different things about religion. And some of them had their own view of Jesus Christ. But there's only one view that matters. It's his view. Or what he reveals to us in the Bible. Without this book, we, you and I would may as well just go and join some mystical community. Yes, why not? Let's all pack up and go out there and hum. Or let's gather in a circle and wait for inspiration from who knows where to help us. You don't realize how important it is to, to have a Bible. And I'm, I'm afraid there are people this morning who go to worship and, and that's what they'll have. They'll have someone who'll open the book and close the book. And then they'll hum. 
or they'll have a, a meditative, contemplative prayer. Whatever happened, just reading the Bible and studying it and uh, trying to explain it. And I admit, some of us preachers, we struggle to explain these things because these are deep things. These are not shallow things. And so Jesus asked them, whose son is he? Now, what do Christians believe about Jesus? Well, here's a summary of what we've been looking at for the last six weeks. We believe he's God's son. We believe he's equal with God. We believe he's the creator of the universe. We believe that he's the son of the living God. Who said that? Peter, do you remember? And then Thomas, my Lord and my God. We believe that all authority is invested in Jesus Christ. We believe that Solomon had a wonderful picture of Jesus, don't we? I know some of you were tickled, taken with that message. He's altogether lovely. And now this morning we're going to just look at what Jesus said. And we're going to look at where Jesus pointed to. He pointed to the Old Testament. Are you an Old Testament Christian? I don't mean are you four or five hundred years past yourself by date. I mean, are you ever in the Old Testament? Do you ever read it? Because Jesus quotes from the Old Testament exclusively. And he quotes from Psalm 110, and it's quoted seven times in the New Testament. And Jesus himself quotes it. And that's why I had Brother Rory read it. And I'm just going to pick out a few things. Because this is marvelous. And it's wonderful. And the Savior's great question is to you. And here's the Bible's grand answer. What is the Bible's grand answer? Well, I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of certain texts of Scripture. But first of all, we're going to stop off in Psalm 110. So let's get our fingers ready. Because we're going to do a lot of page flicking in 25 minutes. Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, middle of the Bible. That's why I say middle of the Bible. It helps friends. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now here's something. There's a conversation going on in heaven. It's not between the angels. It's between God, or heaven, God the Father and God the Son, if we can take it as a New Testament description. It's the Lord God of heaven and earth and it's his beloved son. And here they are. And they're having a conversation. Well, actually, what the Lord God of heaven, the Father, is saying is, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. You're going to be victorious, my son. You're going to destroy the enemies. Our enemies. Those who are ranged against us. They're described in Psalm 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against us who? His anointed one. That's still happening. But the Lord says to, his Lord, to the Lord. Notice in our version it's Lord, capital, capitals, and then as large L and or capital L and then small or lowercase letters. It's Jehovah speaking to Adonai. If you want some Hebrew. Two different people. Persons, sorry, not people, persons. But equal. Sit thou at my right hand. Why the right, not the left? Because the right is the place of blessing, the place of legitimacy, the place of authority. And of course, we read in Matthew 28, all authority has been invested or given unto me, says Jesus. And then the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies, the people, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Who's that? That's you and me, if you're a Christian. Thy people, in the days, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord... Back to God of heaven, the Father, the Lord hath sworn, verse 4, will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, why is this important? 
Because the religious leaders, they would have memorized this. They would have memorized this. They would be looking for a Messiah. It's interesting. Jesus says, not. Who do you think I am? But he asks them, what think ye of Christ? It's a Greek word that's translated as our anointed, or in the Hebrew, it's Messiah. So there they are, they're asked by the Messiah, who do you think is the Messiah? <laughs> Talk about putting them on the spot. But they would have known this text. And then the Lord, verse 5, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. This is Psalm 110. Now there's two questions here under this Bible's great answer. Let's look at Psalm 110. There's a question of legitimacy. Jesus asks them, asks them, whose son is he? Now they're looking for a, a military messiah. One who will launch a great campaign against the great enemies of, so they would call God, the Romans. And the Lord Jesus is a great disappointment because he's not actually going to launch a great assault against the Romans at all. Oh yeah, one day they'll be destroyed. Their empire will be no more. But he's not going to call a great legion from heaven and destroy all these Roman occupiers. Because that's not what he came to do. The first time. But they're expecting this and they're very disappointed. They also don't like the fact that he keeps talking about their sin. And they don't like that. He, don't like, he doesn't like the fact that they're exposing, he's exposing them constantly. With his teaching. Isn't it interesting? They would have known this text. And this text would have pointed them to a Messiah. And yet they won't actually look at the Messiah who is speaking to them face to face. They're so blind. So blind by their religion. So blind by their own self-conceived notions. So blind by the, blinded by their prejudices. That they won't accept who Jesus is. Now later some of them will. But there's a question here of legitimacy. There's also a question of authority. Well, let's look at legitimacy. Which line is Jesus from? Who, who are his descendants? By the way, this was the 18th Messianic Psalm in Psalm 110. <laughs> 18. It sounds as if they just had one Psalm about the Messiah. There's 18 of them and a few more besides. But let's look at this legitimacy. Who, whose line is he? Whose son is he? Jesus has basically pointed to them, saying to them, who do you think I descend from? Of course they should know. Because they've got all the genealogies. And we can be helped by reading Matthew 1, 2 to 20. Hands up here, I won't ask you. you no, know, I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't be fair. But be honest with the Lord. Have you ever skipped over the genealogies in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2? It's okay. Nobody's perfect. But, those genealogies are wonderful. Now we've been looking at some genealogies in Nehemiah. They're a lot more, they're a lot more tedious, to be fair. But, those two genealogies there in Matthew and in Luke show us who Jesus was, where he came from, what line he came down from, that it was prophesied from of old that he would come, the Messiah would come from the line of Judah, and guess what? He did. Though also, there was a prophecy that he would come from the line of David, and guess what? He did. There's also a prophecy that God gives to David about his throne, and David is told that there will, there will be an eternal kingdom with an eternal throne and an eternal king. And guess what? Guess who? This eternal king was Jesus. And this is the problem these religious leaders are having, and this is the problem that our religious leaders are having today. They will not accept that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And I find it quite incredible that there are leaders who claim to be Christians who won't actually believe what the Bible tells them about Jesus. That's sad. But then there's authority. Whose son is he? What, what authority has he got? 
Now we've looked at a legitimacy. Let's look very briefly at authority. Because some people here this morning might think, well, okay, that's fine. We've got a, we've got a historical figure. We've got someone who is a real, living, breathing flesh and blood. Now here is a person who history proves that actually lived. But what's that to me? And that's a good question. But if you look at it a little bit further, at who this man was, and what this man did, and what he claimed, you'll see that this question is vital. What think ye of Christ? Is he just an interesting figure? Figure of history? Maybe he's a very moral man. Oh, if only more people were like Jesus, the world would be a much better place. And in a sense, that's true. But it can never be a reality. Because he's God and man, as we looked at a few weeks ago. And then somebody says, well, well I, like, I like his teaching. I like his religious ideas. But that still doesn't answer the question. The Lord Jesus doesn't ask you, now, what do you think of my religion? Hmm. He says, what think of me? What think of Christ? Some people would have this idea that Jesus was a martyr, and you're right. So you think you're right. Uh, he died, and it's a terrible thing that a good man should die in such a terrible way. And we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper in a few moments, and the fact of the matter is, it's true he died. But he wasn't a martyr like we'd think. He was a sacrifice for sin. He is the only sacrifice for sin. He was the one who offered up himself on the cross. You see, this is really important. Whose son is he? Whose son is he? The Bible's grand answer. Now let's get our fingers going. Because we're going to look at some key texts. He's the Son of God. John chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. You can write these down if you like. He is the Son of God. He is God become man. In Colossians 1 and verse 23, we're told that in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's a message for those who proclaim to be Jehovah's Witnesses. He was with God, says John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Face to face with God before the world began. And he alone is the one whom God addresses as an equal. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16 this. God manifest in the flesh. Not he appeared. Not as if he's just a man with some holy ambitions and holy powers. No. God. Almighty God. Manifesting. Coming forth. Dwelling with the people that he had created and walked with and spoke with and helped and comforted and healed and forgave. God. Manifest in the Paul also writes in Hebrews 1 and verse 3, he's the express image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn has nothing there to do with creation, as in generation or as being born of a man. Firstborn has got to do with inheritance. The Bible teaches us in the Old Testament, I haven't got this verse for you, but I'll give it to you. This is just a... A little encouragement, if you like. Israel is described as the firstborn of God. That doesn't mean that God somehow provide, produced all these people in a, in a physical manner. No. Speaking about inheritance. And here's Jesus being the, 
in the one who will take up the inheritance. He is the son of God. That was number one. There's a few verses. Secondly, he's the son of man. Many, many times in the New Testament, in the Gospels, Jesus takes this term for himself. He's the son of man. The son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 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 Once upon a time I was lost. That's what that man was saying earlier on when I read his story. I was lost. And so were you, dear Christian. You were lost too. We were lost. Spiritually lost. It's a bit like being in a dark wood and not being able to get out of it. And that's been lost. But Jesus came to seek and to save those dime that are lost. He didn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister. He didn't come as one who would lord it over people. He came as a servant, a suffering servant, prophesied from the servant songs in Isaiah. Or Isaiah. Here's the, the Bible's great answer. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. The son of man. And he's the only way to God. And I'll give you a few more verses. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. John 14, verse 6. He says, As none can come unto him except the Father draws him. John 6, and verse 44. If he's the only way to God and he tells us himself he's the way, the truth, and the life, There is no other way, there is no other truth, and there's no other life that will lead to to salvation. Exclusive. But here's another thing. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, he tells us he's the only mediator. He's the only go-between, he's the only priest, he's the only sacrifice, he's the only substitute. He's the only mediator. He's the only one that can stand between you and me. Sorry, you and me. (laughs) You and God this morning. (laughs) Because actually, he stands between me and God this morning. Does he stand between you and God? Is he your mediator? When you rose this morning on a beautiful sunny morning and sought the Lord, do you know your mediator was there mediating for you? Mediating for you. But he's not only mediating for you, he's also mediating all the God's blessings to you. It's a double mediation. He's the only mediator. He's a wonderful mediator. He's a perfect mediator. He's a beautiful mediator. He's my mediator. Is he yours? What think ye of Christ? There's something of the Bible's answer. But I can't leave you without saying this. One day he'll come back. Sooner rather than later. Much sooner than some of us might think. Maybe not as soon as others might think. But he's coming. There's so many things happening in the world today that makes you think, when is he coming? He's coming back to judge the living and the dead. He tells us himself. In the book of Revelation, we're told that Jesus is coming. He's coming. And he'll come not to save, but to judge. You see, this is who Jesus is. And this is the Bible's great answer. And the question I have now for you in closing is this. How will you respond? You see, you've seen something of the Savior's great question. It's a, it's a profound question. He, he began his ministry with asking a question, and he almost ends his ministry with asking a question. And beginning his, quest, his ministry, he started with this idea of love, fellowship. I'll find the text if I can. If you just bear with me. But at the end, he asks, doesn't ask, he says, if ye love them, have love for ye, what reward have ye? And the Christian goes the extra mile, you see. If you're going to reach out to that person who's not really interested in the gospel, maybe loving them will help. Uh, but then the Lord Jesus ends his ministry with this question, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the question he's putting to you now, why have you forgotten me? 
Why have you disowned me? Why have you ignored me? Why have you rejected me? That's what he's saying. He's saying to you, dear friend, this morning. You're sitting there and thinking, but I haven't. But you haven't trusted him. Have you? you haven't asked him to save you. See, this vital response, friend. It's a vital thing. There's two ways. There's God's way. And there's man's way. And which is it? God is very clear. He tells us straight. There's two views. And there's my way or there's man's way. Man's way is like this. I think Jesus is a lovely person. I wish there were more people like Jesus. I met somebody recently who told me something along these lines. I'm very interesting in his teaching. He says some marvelous things. And then you ask the person, but is that all? Or do you know Jesus gave us great examples for social justice? Social justice, that's what it's all about. For saving our planet, that's what it's all about. Now, I'm not saying it's not wrong to try and save the poor unfortunate turtles that are dying because of plastic. But I am saying this. That's not the reason Jesus came. It's not the reason Jesus died. And it's not the reason Jesus is returning. Or there's another person. He was had wonderful ethics. Philosophy. Wonderful ethics. Wonderful teaching. Wonderful morals. We should follow him. We should love those who are unloved. Yeah, and you hear these religious leaders today and they'll jump on the bandwagon and say, I'm a Christian and I follow Jesus. And they bring out these various lovely, ah, uh, vague statements. And God doesn't want anything to do with those kind of things. And God wants us to really think of who he is, who Jesus is. God wants us to redirect our attention and our mind and our hearts to who Jesus truly is. And that's why we have a Bible. Do you ever bless God for having a Bible? There are people this morning in Africa who don't have their own personal copy of a Bible. There are. And I don't know how many copies you have on your shelf, but I've got a few. Because I look at different translations, of course, for the messages. But this question is vital. It's either God's way or man's way. And dearly beloved, God would have you go his way. And God would have you this morning leaving this place thinking of Jesus. Pondering him. Standing back and gazing at him. Marveling at him. Exalting and exulting in him. Rejoicing in him. Look at my son. Isn't he wonderful? That's what he's saying. Look at my son. Isn't he glorious? Look at my son and see him bleeding on the cross for you. Look at my son and see how he suffers and how he's punished and how he's in pain and in agony for you. Look at my son. He's unrecognizable from the man who took up the ministry three years before. But look at him nonetheless. Think upon him. Ponder him. And then the Christian Look at my son. See what he has done for you. See how he has taken your sin and your shame and your guilt and was punished in your place. Look at my son and ponder how he who knew no sin became sin for you that you might become the righteousness of God in him. 
2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Look at my son and see how he's expiring in his last breath and he's felt the forsakenness of God and yet he's willing to go all the way through it for you. Look at my son. What think you of him now? Look at my son as he gives up his last breath and says, into, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Look at my son as he's lying in the grave for three days, but look at him as he rises up and now he's exalted above all and every name, his name is above every name and every knee shall bow and tongue confess that my son is Lord. Look at my son as he's on his way back. He's coming. Ponder it afresh. See him as he begins his journey from the glory. For soon he'll be healed. Look at him. You see, the Christian believes all of those things about their Savior. And more besides. It's either man's view or God's view. Which is it, friend? I commend my Savior to you. I leave that question with you. What think you of Christ now? I'll add a little word in. Now. Is he still just a religious figure that has a passing interest or is he your Savior? Can you sing this song with John Newton? We don't have it in our hymn book, but that's okay. We will have it. We'll learn it soon. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fears. That's my Savior. I trust that's your Savior too. We'll take the table in a moment. But we're going to sing a hymn, number 175. Some of us know it as man of sorrows, what a name. Others know it as hallelujah, what a savior. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a savior. Are you smiling, Christian? What a savior. What a wonderful savior we have. Verse 2, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place, condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. That's a Hebrew word. Praise the Lord. What a savior. Let's stand to sing.
Father, hallelujah, what a Savior. Oh, we thank you, Father, for sending your Son. For sending your Son to be the Savior of our souls. We thank you, O Father, revealing your Son to us by the Spirit. We thank you, O Father, for opening our blind eyes. For taking away the scales from our eyes. For softening our hard hearts. For unstopping our deaf ears. We thank you, O Lord, Father, that you have shown us what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he has done. And how he suffered and bled and died to save us from our sins. We thank you, O Father, for revealing afresh to us this morning how wonderful and beautiful he truly is and how he sustains us and how he keeps us and how he mediates for us even now. We thank you, O Father, for hearing our prayers. We pray for those who listen in this morning. We pray your blessing upon them this day. We pray that souls will be saved through the ministry of this church and the ministry of the gospel. For we ask these prayers in the Savior's precious name. Amen.